Hello everyone. Specifying an appropriate element size for finite element meshes is critical to obtaining accurate results in a reasonable amount of time. Coarse meshes may give inaccurate results if the stress gradients are too large for the elements to capture properly. Too small of an element size will unnecessarily increase the computational costs and solution times. ANSYS Mechanical has various tools to specify the element size in order to achieve the typical end goal of a mesh independent solution where the results do not change with further increases in mesh density. In this video, we will illustrate the effects element size has on derived results quantities such as stress and strain. We'll cover several of the mesh sizing options available. While the proper element size may not be known before the solution, there are post-processing settings such as results averaging and nodal differences to check the appropriateness of the element size specified. We have a short lecture, and then we get into ANSYS Mechanical to illustrate the concepts on the mechanical part. So let's get started. Specifying an appropriate element size is fundamental in finite element modeling. It is often the desire to obtain a mesh independent solution, meaning the results don't change with increases in mesh density. While this means running more than one solution to verify, one can also review the stress gradient through the elements to determine if the gradients are too high. Here, we can see a large gradient of the stress through the element. And here, with a finer mesh size, we have a smaller stress gradient. In the limit of infinite mesh density, the stress gradient theoretically disappears and the element has constant stress. We do not need to go to the extremes of zero stress gradient to achieve accurate results, and having a stress gradient is acceptable but we wish to avoid excessive gradients. We'll see more about this when we get into mechanical. So we can use our simulation results to evaluate if the mesh size is sufficient, and then we can use meshing controls to define the appropriate element size in order to accurately capture the results. Now, there are various display options available when we wish to report our results. Which we choose is important, so let's first understand how derived quantities such as stress or strain are computed. We'll use a shell finite element in a structural simulation to illustrate the concepts. The element has displacement as the unknown quantity that is solved for at the nodes. Using the strain displacement matrix, the strains for each element are computed from the solved displacements. These strain values are computed at the Gaussian integration points. We can then compute the stresses using the constitutive equations of the material model. Next, those strain or stress values are typically extrapolated to the corner nodes using the shape functions of the element because we want to know the stress field across the element and often the highest stresses are on the outside surfaces of the mesh. Thus, we wish to have the results at the nodes which lie on the surface of the mesh. Now, if every element has its own values at the nodes, and since the elements can share a common node with the neighbor, the question we may ask is, which of these is the right value of stress to use at a given node? Do we leave them unaveraged, which would result in a range of values at each node, including the highest and the lowest at the node, or should we simplify things and average them? For example, here you can see how we have taken the values from the integration points, extrapolate using each element shape function, and we can average them or leave them unaveraged. By averaging, we will lose the peaks, but we have just one value to consider. This averaging makes our contour plots nice and smooth, and we have just one value per node to consider. But couldn't this reduce the value reported from the highest peak of one of the elements that share the common node? Yes, but when we have a sufficient mesh density, where results do not change appreciably with further reduction in element size, we have what is known as a mesh independent solution. In this case, we will see little to no difference between the averaged or unaveraged stress output. So the choice in that case is easy. It won't make a difference which we use when we have an appropriate mesh density. So if we see a large difference between the averaged and the unaveraged stresses or strains, it is typically an indication that we do not have sufficient mesh density in that region. There are some other useful display options we can utilize when we report the results. There's nodal difference and elemental difference. 
the nodal difference provides the maximum difference between the unaveraged computed result for all elements that share a particular node. The elemental difference produces the maximum difference of all unaveraged nodal values for an element. Now let's get into ANSYS Mechanical to have a closer look using a simulation model of a clevis. A clevis can be used in a system to transfer load from one part to another. In this case, we have a clevis that threads onto a rod, which is fixed at one end. At the other end, the clevis connects to a mechanical part with a lug that has a load. The load is transferred to the clevis via a clevis pin. Our goal is to have a mesh independent solution of the peak stress in the clevis. For the simulation, we will only model the clevis and apply the appropriate boundary conditions to represent the loading and parts that are not modeled. Okay, we are inside of ANSYS Workbench. Drag and drop a static structural system on the project page. Right click on Geometry Cell, Import Geometry, Browse, and pick the file named Clevis. Double click on the model cell to open ANSYS Mechanical. Expand the Geometry object and click on the part named Clevis. The assignment is structural steel, and we wish to change it to aluminum alloy. Click on Materials. In the search box, type in aluminum, hover over aluminum alloy, and pick the plus icon to add the material to the project. Change the material assignment to aluminum alloy. Let's use a default mesh on the part, so right click on mesh and pick generate mesh. Now let's add the boundary conditions. Click on static structural, select the hole in the clevis. For the threaded rod attachment, we will use a cylindrical support, which allows us to control the degrees of freedom of cylindrical shaped faces. Right click, insert cylindrical support. Let's assume the rod is tightly threaded into the clevis, so we will leave radial, axial, and tangential degrees of freedom as fixed. To represent the load a clevis pin would exert on the clevis, we can use a bearing load. A bearing load is a special boundary condition which applies a radial pressure over the selected faces with a total force value specified. It has a sinusoidal distribution to achieve the effect of a pin in a hole. While it does not model the detailed contact behavior, which we could account for if desired with additional modeling and setup, it does a good job of approximating the force distribution over the compression portion of the cylindrical face. The peak pressure is in the direction of the load application, and it decreases to zero at positive and negative 90 degrees from the load application direction. Here we can see vector arrows showing the pressure distribution and if we graph the pressure versus angle, we can see the shape of the distribution. So let's apply a bearing load to the two holes of the clevis. Pick the two faces, right click, insert bearing load. Change the defined by two components and specify minus 20,000 newtons in the Z direction. Note that we are applying a total force of 20,000 not 20,000 newtons on each face. If the faces have different areas, the load would be distributed in an area-weighted manner. Let's solve the model. With the model solved, pick on Solution, Insert Stress, Equivalent von Mises, right-click on Solution and pick Evaluate All Results. Note the max stress value in the legend and notice how the stress has a very large gradient from almost 100 megapascals all the way down to the teens. Just to note, depending on the default mesh generated on your model, the values you see may vary. Also note how the stress contours are continuous from element to element. So we don't see breaks in the color bands across element boundaries when we use the default of averaged for the display option. 
Now right click on the equivalent stress object and pick duplicate without results. Change the display option from averaged to unaveraged. Right click and evaluate all results. Now notice the higher max result value in the legend and the discontinuous contours from element to element. Recall from our discussion that with unaveraged results, we report the results from each element and do not average at the nodes. Now let's compare them side by side. Click on the display tab, pick viewports, two vertical viewports. Select one of the viewports. Now pick the equivalent stress plot that has the average display option. We can compare the results side by side. At this point, we do not have an accurate value of the max stress in the clevis because of this difference due to the coarse mesh density. Keep in mind, since we have the results scoped to the entire body, the legend is reporting the maximum value, which can occur anywhere on the entire body. Thus, visual comparison of the two plots does not provide us with a direct node-to-node -node comparison. Let's pick the stress results again and duplicate without results. Now change the display option to nodal difference. Notice the very large nodal difference reported at the location where we had the high stress. The advantage of using this method is it shows the actual variation at each node. Comparing the maximum values from average versus unaveraged contour plots as we did earlier gives us a rough idea of the difference, but is not exact since those maximum values may be in different locations. However, the nodal difference plot allows us to clearly see the magnitude of the difference in extrapolated stresses at each node. Recall that this is the maximum difference between the unaveraged computer results for all elements that share a particular node. We would like to see a much smaller difference. So we can use results to determine if the mesh size is adequate, and in this case we can see that it is not the case. We have a very large stress gradient across single elements, large differences between averaged and unaveraged, and a large value reported for nodal difference. If there were no gradients across the elements, there'd be no difference. While we typically do not achieve zero stress gradients as the mesh size decreases, we should more closely approach a mesh independent solution provided it is not a stress singularity. So let's try and improve upon our mesh and achieve a more mesh independent solution. Let's use mesh controls to reduce the element size in the high stress gradient region of the holes. There are many size control options available, and in this video we will only explore specifying a mesh size directly scoped to a region of the model, in this case the part faces. Also note, there are tools available to automate this process, such as convergence or parameterizing the mesh size, but we will also not get into those in this video. Right click on Mesh, Insert Sizing. Select the two faces of the clevis as shown using the control key to enable multiple selections. Pick Apply in the details. For the element size, specify 0.5 millimeters. Click on Mesh and under Sizing, change the transition from fast to slow. This will create a more gradual transition of mesh size from the 0.5 millimeters to our default size. Right click on mesh and pick generate mesh. Now right click on solution and pick solve. Return to the two viewport view via display viewports two vertical viewports. Click on the left viewport and click on the first equivalent stress with the display option of averaged. Click on the right viewport and click on the second equivalent stress result with display option of unaveraged. First note the small difference in maximum stress in legend between averaged and unaveraged results. Now zooming in, we can see while there is still a gradient across the element, it spans a much smaller stress range. Also notice in the unaveraged stress plot that discontinuous color bands across element edges are very minimal. 
Now pick on the nodal difference results. Since it is scoped to the entire part, the high values happen to be away from the refined mesh. So right click and duplicate without results. Click on all bodies and now select the face selection icon and select the two faces of the clevis hole using the control key. Pick apply and then right click evaluate all results. If we zoom in, we can see the nodal difference is now much smaller. The nodal difference is in units of stress, so you may view this as the amount of stress variation that may be tolerated. So from a smaller stress gradient to averaged and unaveraged results and a small nodal difference, we can start to make the determination if we are approaching a mesh independent solution. If we continue this process, we'll find that the results become independent of mesh size. Have a look at this plot of averaged and unaveraged equivalent stress versus element size. We can see how the two curves approach a common value as the element size decreases. Okay, so let's summarize. Finite element results are dependent on the mesh size specified. Seeing high gradients through the elements of derived quantities, such as stress or strain, is a good first indication that the element size may be too large. While we may not know the mesh size required to give accurate results before solving, using the results, one can check and add mesh sizing as necessary. The results have display options such as averaged and unaveraged and difference that can be used for this check. While it may seem like trial and error, with experience, the appropriate element sizes can be specified. Finally, we used manual mesh size controls in this video, but there are more automated ways to achieve numerically accurate stresses that will be covered in another course. I hope you found this video informative. Thank you for watching and do check out our other courses to discover more useful learning resources.